going on guys it's nick from conquest cars today we're going to be checking out the 2020 ford expedition and this is not just any regular ford expedition it's the king ranch okay let's talk the engine so this vehicle comes with a twin turbo 3.5 liter Ford EcoBoost engine, so it's a V6, and that's a little bit of a controversial take in the segment. So normally, when you have one of these big seven-seater family haulers, they have the V8 engine, always has been the most reliable option. Uh, quite honestly, no other engine has really been able to compete by putting out the same, I guess the same amount of power. Uh, but this one kind of hits the sweet spot between both worlds. Uh, power and fuel economy, it's exceptionally strong. 460 horsepower, 510 pound-feet of torque. What does that mean? It means it's awesome at towing. Uh, it has one of the best in-class towing capabilities. So if you got a heavy boat, a trailer, something like that, this engine is up for the challenge. Fun fact too, it's actually the same engine that the Ford Raptor has, which is kind of cool. There I am. You'll have the uh, power and retractable uh, steps here, so it makes it nice and convenient to get in and out. There's no lag, nothing like that. I've had the car for a week. I haven't noticed it's glitched out at all. Uh, as soon as you're driving, like again, you turn the car off, you, you press the door handle right here. As soon as you do that, the steps fold down. I haven't had any problems. Uh, and let's talk about warranty for a sec because we were just talking about the engine. So Ford comes with a three year, 60,000 kilometer warranty. Um, so again, talking about the V6, some people may shudder at the idea, okay, there's more parts, uh, more stuff will break. That's generally how the way things go. But um, this is more of a lease heavy vehicle opposed to finance correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Americans, but in Canada, at least seven out of 10 times, you're probably gonna be leasing the car. It has really good resale value, so that means you're gonna get a strong residual payment. Uh, uh, you know, people buying this used, generally, generally the price is you know, a little bit, uh, you know, it holds its value well, right? Uh, so that means you're gonna get a really good lease payment. So you don't really have to be too concerned about the V6. You know, if you're gonna be doing a lot of, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't want to say speeding in the car, but spanking it, right? Uh, you have a warranty of the first three years. Generally, your lease is not going to be longer than four to five. Uh, so for the most part, you're covered, and I wouldn't really expect any problems. Uh, first impressions getting in the car really fast, uh, being an Olufsen sound system. I know there's always this whole idea of you know the speaker count. Bottom line, there's enough speakers, it sounds good, it's loud, and it's balanced. Sometimes you get in these cars and you know they make a big deal about okay, it's this wattage, you know, subwoofer or output, who cares? Does it sound good or does it not? It sounds good. End of story. It gets loud if you want it to, and it doesn't over exaggerate any of the tones between the mids or the trebles uh, or the bass and that's kind of one of the things I like sometimes when you get in these SUVs they have a really huge subwoofer and you know maybe the car the frame it's not really insulated well and it just kind of starts to rattle and the louder you turn it the shittier everything sounds it's not the case with this car um, you know first impressions with the steering wheel a little too plastically plasticky takes a lot of the um, you know same cues from the Ford F-150 it's basically a Ford F-150 steering wheel and driver uh, you know, dash here, you have analog speedometer, tachometer, um, doesn't really bother me, but the one thing that does irritate me is they made the attempt at the digital cluster in the center. It almost has an information overload, like it's really hard to get to the menu that you want, like very simple. Most people I'm sure just want the fuel economy and the speed I'm going, so you don't have to look at the cluster, but um, this car, for some reason it's buried, I don't know why. You know, trip one, trip two, that's fine. You have a bunch of information here. Like I said, information overload, I don't tow anything. You know, if you're getting this SUV, probably you're gonna be towing some stuff. So there are some good facts, but quite honestly, like again, I don't know how concerned most people would be with that. Generally, you just wanna know how fast you're going and how much gas you have left. And, you know, let's keep it at that. And even like you'll see the, the, the speedometer, which is weird, there's so much real estate on the center digital piece and it could look so cool. It doesn't cost anything you know, to, to make it a couple pixels bigger. It feels way too small. Like they didn't take good use of the screen. It just, I don't know, it's an 80, 80 something thousand dollar car here in Canada. 99% um, of the time when you're driving, this is your impression of the vehicle. Um, and again, it kind of makes it, makes it feel cheaper, let's, let's just say. Uh, but hold on for one second, we'll talk interior. Uh, the leather is stitching, so this is a King Ranch edition. The interior is absolutely awesome. Um, the seats are awesome, they're ventilated. And one thing I will give props to for Ford is finally we have a heated steering wheel button, a physical button that you can press. It's not buried within the menus. That Ford Explorer that we had in the Ford Mustang, the heated steering wheel was buried in that infotainment menu. So imagine it's really cold outside. You have your gloves, it's a Canadian winter. Nobody wants to be looking through to f find out you know, which, uh, which menu they have to dig through to get heated steering wheel. Seems like common sense. Anyways, they fixed it for this. Uh, driver room impressions. You got this little dial here. It's kind of the way it's going. Say goodbye to your shifters. The new Denali Yukon has the you know the flick shifter as I like to say on their center center console as well. Um, just it does the job. Like 
it, it really doesn't matter anymore in my opinion, especially again, you're leasing the car, everything's right there. You do have a phone charging cubby. I think maybe this was like a cue from the designers. You'll see that Ford, they've, they've, they've almost like made a phone inaccessible while it's charging. I think that's kind of cool, um, but it actually makes it a little bit difficult to get my phone out. Like I definitely don't have the biggest hands, but digging through here, I feel like I'm reaching through like a hole to get my phone. Um, I guess they're running out of room. It's fine placement. Uh, the good thing about that is you can close it. So if you're going somewhere, you know, there's plenty of space. You can leave your stuff there. Although there's clear warning. You're not really supposed to have your keys or wallet or anything in a wireless charging spot. Don't know. I don't think it wipes the credit card, but for keys and key fobs and all that, pretty sure it will mess with the battery. So really if you're storing stuff here, I don't think you're really supposed to. So it kind of becomes like this, this dead space really. Um, you know, you have a massive center console too. There's no reason you need to store anything there. Um, in terms of the infotainment, I think this is the Sync, I think this is the Sync 4. Um, 4 does a good job with it. You know, you have all your climate controls here on the on the infotainment. The one thing I will say, it's, it's a little bit slow. Um, there's a little bit of a lag like between navigation and phone. Uh, in terms of getting phone calls right away, the Bluetooth pair is super quick. No problems with that whatsoever. The other thing that I do appreciate is when you are switching between radio stations or sources, uh, you know, I find some vehicles, they hiccup between getting back onto Bluetooth. This thing doesn't miss a beat, so kudos to you guys. Uh, but again, kind of the navigation between some of the menus. It's really only when you're flipping the nav, but listen, if you're about to miss your exit and you need to get back to that nav screen, and you know, it's do or die five seconds, could be something that you love, you know, probably hate about the car. So let's just be fair. So now we're hanging out in the back seats of the Expedition. As you can see, there's, uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see, this is a wide angle lens, but there's a ton of space back here. I'm gonna open the other door, maybe to let in a little bit more light, but yeah, if you're worried about the second row passengers fighting, you know, smacking elbows, there's a, uh, there's no chance of that. There's a huge separation. I'm actually, uh, you know, growing up as the youngest child, I have to say, uh, I'm a fan that they left so much room for the back seats to get back there. I always felt like I was a mission by being the youngest. It's, uh, you know, the third row is kind of where I called home, but um, you, can, you can access these seats pretty easily. Okay, check that movie magic out. Now I'm in the third row and I gotta say, it's actually, it's actually pretty comfortable. I thought it was gonna be a lot smaller than it was. Let me just see, you know, the, the headrest test. It's actually not bad. Like my head, I'm not the tallest guy in the, on the planet. My head's definitely touching the back here, but I don't think anybody's necessarily gonna be leaning all the way back like that. As again, if anybody's a preference, you're sitting in the left or the right. I don't feel claustrophobic. Sometimes when I sit in these third row SUVs, it's really easy to feel claustrophobic. And the cool thing is it's kind of cute. You actually have this two buttons here, you know, God bless the third party, third row passengers, but you can actually move your seat backwards and forwards. Adds a little bit more comfort. There's actually a ton of room, like surprising. There's a lot of reg leg room here. And again, you don't have a whole lot of trunk space, but you know, at the expense of the third party, I think it's well worth it. You know, I wouldn't mind sitting back here. I get motion sickness. I don't think this would be that much of a problem. It's kind of cool that you do. There's little buttons here to move the car, lean the car seat forward and backwards. So that's not bad at all. I do appreciate the fact that there are some vents back here as well um, that work very well. You haven't been neglected. You got the lights. You actually have USB chargers as well. So if you got to charge your stuff and on this side, you have a 12 volt outlet. So, you know, cigarette lighter, if you need to charge some stuff back here, uh, you'll never run out of juice. Good job, Ford. So yes, the Expedition does come with tri-zone climate control. So what does that mean? Tri just means you have the extra option to set the temperature here in the back row for the passengers. Uh, now that means the temperature that the second row gets is the same that the third row gets. But again, you get to control the fan speed. You also have heated seats. Um, these buttons always back here kind of made me laugh. Technically you can control, here we'll turn that off fast before we get a counter claim copyright strike, but you can control the radio. Not sure in what world, these days people are actually still listening to the radio or the backseat passengers maybe are operating that. Uh, but to be totally fair, again, you have your 150 watt outlet. So you can basically plug anything in here, uh, a laptop, you know, phone charger, whatever. You also have your phone chargers here. You have two USB slots and you have a 12 volts, 12 volt cigarette lighter. So really, uh, I don't think anybody's gonna be listening to the radio. You're probably gonna be on your smartphones 
your tablets, all that good stuff. Okay, if I'm allowed to be picky here, I know I'm super close to the camera. I wanted to show you guys here. I'll just move it for a second and I'll see if we can get a better view. That handle right there, that handle looks pretty innocent, right? You know, it's a big truck. Yeah, you have the steps. It should be easy to get in and out of, but you'll see right here, the, the door handle illuminates blue at night. So it's cool. There's some nice ambient lighting. Sorry, I'm disappearing in the camera here. There's some really good ambient lighting, but what I found is this handle here produced an unnecessary blind spot in the car, which is such a shame because it's a bigger SUV. Yeah, you have all the safety tech, but it's always nice to be able to look and see where you're going. In reality, I, I don't understand like the handles here. That's great, you know, for those who need it, but it provides a huge blind spot for the driver. And again, because you have this little LED that glows here in the door panel, a lot of times I was looking, I thought there was just somebody coming up at me with really bright LED headlights. So, you know, for don't, don't put this on the next gen model. That's kind of silly or move it in a way that doesn't affect the driver visibility. Okay. So just playing around with the infotainment, hopefully you guys will be able to see. So you have which I'm a fan of. You have all of your climate control buttons are all analog at the bottom here, including that heated steering wheel, like I had mentioned. Um, we'll just take a poke around the menu. We'll go home. As you can see, so we'll play around for a second. You'll see it is relatively fast until you get to the navigation. Now, when I have my phone connected and I'm playing music and I'm kind of switching around between songs, then all of a sudden you want to jump to the nav. You know what? It's, <laughs> it must be doing pretty well, but I found it was lagging a little bit. So anyways, just peeking through the menus, I do like how you have climate control right here as well on this cluster. Uh, it kind of makes it easy, especially if it's one of those days where it's really overcast or really muggy. And it's kind of that mixture between humid and, and, and warm and kind of being too cold in the car when you're sweaty. Um, super minor stuff, but you know, it's an expensive car. Let's just talk about it. Um, the one thing I will say this car, it's funny, it doesn't have massaging seats. Now, if you've never had the privilege of experiencing massaging seats in a car, in most of them that have it, you're probably not missing out on anything. They really, most of them do suck to be quite honest. I'm glad Ford didn't say that they have them, just say they have them. Probably would have affected the price point and it probably wouldn't have said that they're very good. Uh, so anyways, uh, the massaging seats and to be totally unbiased, um, the massaging seats in most cars do suck. Um, the ones in the Explorer literally felt like you were on an airplane and somebody was kicking you from the back gently and slowly but nonetheless kicking you like you're on an airplane. So I'm glad that they didn't include that, that's for sure. Um, again, switching around, I believe this is the Ford Sync 4. Um, I would love to be corrected. Again, you do have your heated steering wheel button right here. It does, you'll see, hopefully turn on at the bottom there, but I'm just glad there's an analog button. You have your hill descent control. So if you are trailering something, it'll automatically apply braking. Good feature to have. Most big seven seater SUVs will have that now. Traction control on or off. Lane keep assist, automatic stop start. And of course you can click that button and get your 360 camera. Hopefully you guys can see that. Okay, cool. Now we'll talk storage. So this vehicle, uh, funny enough, most vehicles have a kick motion here or the left side, as long as you have the key fob in your pocket. Uh, this ex expedition doesn't have that. Uh, kind of a shame for a 78, you know, $80,000 vehicle. I thought it was gonna be really cool the first time I showed my girlfriend, hey, check this out, watch this. I ended up just, you know, karate kicking the air behind the car. Uh, now it does have the hands-free lift gate, sure it should, right? Uh, you have that on the key fob as well. It's pretty convenient. Uh, you'll see though, so I got, you know, my junk here. I don't know for what it's worth. These are super tiny. I don't know if you'll be able to see these. These are super tiny bins. You know, they're about the length of my forearm here. It's just what I store some of my gear in, some of the car cleaning stuff. I got two of these. I got a camera bag. I got a camera case and a tripod. Uh, you know, this is kind of standard. You can't really knock it. Uh, most of these seven seater vehicles are gonna have this amount of space in the, you know, after the third row, you'd need the Ford Expedition Max to have a little bit more of that cargo room. Again, if you were to jump into any Yukon, any Tahoe, you're gonna have the same amount of room. You either need the Suburban, you know, the Ford Expedition Max, or of course the Yukon XL or the Escalade ESV, right? So it's just kind of one of those things in terms of any neat things about it, really. The only cool thing that you do have is you have the third row that folds flat. So you can just press the button and they both do that. Uh, now you can use power as well to get the seats to fold back up in the third row. In terms of, I'll show you for the second row, 
Check that out, they just smack down, but you can't have any button to bring them back up. We'll just show you in the third row. The third row comes back up. So again, if you want to use this and keep the third row down and just use it for the extra storage, by all means, it's totally okay to do. And it's not really much of a hassle to be able to flip between that. As you can see, I was talking, my hands were on my hips. It wasn't that hard, uh, but again, you. Pretty much you're not necessarily buying this car uh you know for all the extra storage you may go for the max or again just opt to have the third row down again hands free look at that it's actually it's kind of rewarding it's so easy a little slow but it does the job you know better safe than sorry i guess uh but again the second row you'll see i actually have to get in here open the door and manually god forbid right open this one back up and there you have it Look at that life hack. We just switched around the microphone. It's on the seatbelt now. I wonder if that's gonna make a difference. Sorry if that was irritating. So here we go. We're going for a ride. We're in an empty parking lot. Um, the sunroof is open. The first thing that I will say is driving this car, it's smooth. Apparently it has a rear independent suspension. It is a little bumpy. Um, uh, Here's, here's my analogy. If I am going over a speed bump in the no frills parking lot and I real like, listen, it's not that I'm trying to go fast, but uh, in a no frills parking lot, but when you're on the speed bump, you really feel it. Like it's kind of aggressive, like on the small bumps, totally fine. It does a job. I'll accept it. Um, but when you're going over little speed bumps, it's all, it's almost like the suspension. It's not tuned enough um, to kind of recognize that. Uh, I reference, and you can say this is complete nonsense, I'm referencing just very simply put the Yukon Denali's, they have the Magna Rides and the Escalades. The suspension on the Yukons in particular is so smooth. Uh, when you're going over those bumps, it's almost like whoever has engineered the product has done such a good job, uh, they recognize the fact that it's going over that and it, it eats the impact a little bit more. Again, I'm not suggesting you're ramming into these things full blast, but uh, it does a job. I'm just gonna close the sunroof here. Okay, we've been sitting at that light forever. Finally got the advanced screen. I cut all that footage because it was me just kind of awkwardly ignoring the camera, uh, <laughs> trying not to use my best material. And then I started getting thinking for a sec. Hey, I really don't have a whole lot of research planned on this car. Like we can talk about the drive and we can talk about all that fun stuff. Uh, but probably the best thing I usually find is, you know, the driver just shuts up. I can't give you a history lesson. I honestly don't know much about the expedition. And to be quite honest, it's a car. It's getting you A to B. You know, I'm sorry, I, I have no fill. Um, you know, what can I say? Driving the car, again, it is pretty smooth. I don't want to repeat myself. Uh, there's your sport mode. Um, not that, uh, not that exciting. Like, don't get me wrong, super fast, super heavy SUV, but kind of what, it, what, what really is impressive about the car is when you're finally at, uh, you know, a speed above 100, once you have the speed above 100, that's when this thing really shines, like I said, for those lane changes. We're not gonna push it too hard. So there you go, we just went kind of fast. But again, look, the thing that bugs me, I'm trying to flip through the menus here, where is it? Where's my, f I don't want fuel economy, I want my digital speedometer, there we go. I don't know, it just doesn't do it for me. Uh, call me picky, it doesn't do it for me. The one thing I will say as well to driving this car, so the lane keep assist is, th this is one of the things I feel like about the vehicle that kind of distracts the fact that the suspension is probably better than it seems, but it's just a really, really dumb feature. So basically, when you're going in the wrong lane, right? You have the, the grid on your center steering, you know, your display here. You have this button that will kind of let you know you're going the wrong lane. But what it does is it starts vibrating the whole vehicle. So I think what they intended is it just supposed to vibrate the steering wheel to kind of give you a gentle reminder that you should probably get in the right lane or probably get in the lane you're supposed to. But what it ends up doing is making the car feel like it's about to fail. Like something is about, to, like the wheels are about to fall off. I think that's really, really stupid. Like, to be fair, we were just in, uh, you know, the Explorer didn't do that. Last week we had the Maserati, we had the Volvo. Volvo gives you a beautiful little chime to let you know, hey, you should probably put your hands back on the steering wheel, A, or B, get back in your lane. Totally fine, I accept that. It was an annoying, nice little driver's aid cue. But again, this feature where all of a sudden it starts to rumble, it feels like, 
your tires aren't balanced. It's really stupid, especially for a 78, like again, I keep saying that, but $80,000 plus SUV. I don't, I don't like that. If there was a gentle chime, that would make a world of difference and give me a lot more confidence probably in driving the vehicle. Um, so anyways, there's that. Okay, so I know I talked about it earlier, but this vehicle, uh, as with all seven-seaters, full-size vehicles, is gonna have a wicked resale value, residual value, so it's gonna be worth still quite a lot of money, even one, two, three, four years old. So what does that mean? It's least heavy. So I know we talked about the engine, by all means, with 60,000 kilometers, listen, the average Canadian drives about 18 to 20,000, maybe a little bit above, maybe below. There's certainly extended warranty plans on that, but for the caliber of the engine, for the amount of juice that you get, Buy the extended warranty and push it because you're not really going to have that much fun in any other vehicle. It's funny though, I will say like you do get a lot more high-end power in this engine compared to that V8 off the line. Initially you have that V8 kind of torquey pull and you hear the roar and it feels cool. But what's even better is when you're on the highway, like I said, and you're lane changing and you just, you feel the whoosh. Um, if that's what turbos make, that's apparently the sound that they make now. Um, but yeah, it feels a lot more confident. Um, here I am though, in this ivory tower, I don't want to say I'm complaining about anything. I'm just providing kind of the real side of things, but I got to say the vented seats, when they work, they work well. Now I don't know. It's been very hot. You know, today's 28 earlier today. It was like 32 degrees. The vented seats, they seem a little inconsistent. Maybe it's because sometimes I'll jump in the car. I'll go for a three minute drive, Tim Hortons, whatever. And it's just, it was too fast to get the, the vented seats really going, but it's kind of funny. I don't know if you'll hear that on the mic, but when you're leaning back against it, you can hear the, you can feel the, the suction, you know, of it pulling the air away from you. So anyways, the cooled seats in my ivory tower right now, life is pretty good. Okay, sound system test. Listen, I keep saying, oh no, we don't want to get a copyright strike. Listen, we're not even monetized. Stacy's mom, there you go. Sounds pretty good. Okay, hopefully that doesn't do anything to the video. Not like there's many people watching it, but um, it's kind of, you know, I gotta respect the sound system in this. It sounds really good. Quite honestly, it's way better balanced than the, the Explorer. Um, they did an excellent job in this. Again, when you crank the volume, it doesn't sound like any of the, uh, any of the, the speakers are overcompensating. Sometimes you'll have that little bit of the trick, the ambient trick where you crank it really high and then at a certain point, the back speakers stop giving that juice and all of a sudden it's just the, the driver's side speakers and it literally throws the whole, you know, the balance of the audio out of whack. You don't get that problem in this car. Um, in terms of quietness, I'll just be quiet for a second. It's pretty quiet. Um, now you could go online, you could read Edmunds. And it may say it's not. Some people may say it is, but listen, it's quiet. And I, th I think the other thing that does help it too is you're not, you don't have that V8 engine. So sometimes you hear a little bit more of that whoosh. I keep saying whoosh, but you hear more of that rumble in that V8 engine. And it sounds a little bit more aggressive, kind of making things seem like they're louder. You don't get a lot of you don't get a lot of road noise. You don't get a lot of cabin noise. It's pretty well insulated, I'd say. Um, so it's got that going for it. 